Uh, today we have a man of letters, an esteemed colleague, a doctor, a scientist, <laughs> Dr. Wu. Welcome to the show, Powerful Truth Angels. Yes, um, finally. Yeah, finally got him on. Yeah, we're talking about the sign. That sign was painted by Julian Blesser, who is the nephew of Finn, who is Alexis Ross's partner. Mm. And Alexis Ross and Finn, I want to say 20 years ago even, were just like, what they would do is, because they learned how to sign paint, yeah. right? And they just, just because they wanted to. It wasn't even like, I think, I would like to think that they were the predecessors to this wave of sign painters yeah they're not the first ones but they kind of like you know there's a few graffiti writers who drifted into sign painting yeah and uh one of the dudes is a teacher at uh lacc he's still there and so he's a he's an og writer i forget his name right now because i'm frazzled but i should mm. know he's an he's an og head a real graffiti writer and he teaches a sign painting class anyways alexis and finn started sign painting i think they're mostly self-taught what they would do is they would go to a business they go to a garage somewhere and they say, let us paint your sign for you. And they'd be like, well, why? Like, we just want to. And they would just take a few days and just repaint their signs. So around LA, you just see this like new version mm. of an old sign, but done like different, to a T. Different colors. kind of Yeah. Different but like a whole new imagining. Like and it's always something funny going on. Like, yeah. you know, like there's that drug bug thing in the other room that Alexis did way back in the day. Alexis and Finn did that. Yeah. Um, but Julian is Finn's nephew. Crazy. Uh, and Julian is also a graffiti writer, um, and an established one, but I'm not going to blow his cover or I think, I think he quit. I don't know. <laughs> Shout out to Julian. Um, and he, um, he hooked that up for us on the quick fly and, uh, you know, yeah, awesome. and there it is. Yeah. It's in, it's in that lineage. It's legit. You yeah. Know? Cause I mean, in the tattoo world, the sign painting was such a big part of it. It was such like yeah. a, um, kind of like a collegial thing sign painters and you know the, all the tattoo shops all the classic tattoo shops would have the the og sign painting um so it was cool when i saw it, it kind of reminded me of all the different yeah the shop signs, signs i've seen throughout the throughout the years you know yeah if you don't be long don't be, don't long. be long yeah yeah. yeah yeah that stuff is that whole kind of yeah man that that <laughs> that's the great thing about tattoo shops is yeah. that it's holding on to this some of it right yeah. it's holding on to this like this really old carnival fucking you know what i'm saying like totally. this this i don't know how to how to explain it but it's like this very kind of it's like the pedigree it's because it's like you can hand or right. pass down the lineage and the story of you know the the shop or whoever the the master the tattoo master was that right. started everything but yeah it's like all the signs you know no miners no whiners right no, tipping is in a city in China. <laughs> <laughs> that one, yeah. Classic. Yeah, so yeah. it was cool. It was like, it was just like more storytelling, you know? Yeah, that kind of stuff is, is crazy. And like I, um, you know, I came up in the, I had a, when I was younger, I was briefly going to be a tattoo artist and I had an apprenticeship at a place in Venice called Tattoo Asylum, mm. right? And I was there for like a year. And it was at that time, I mean, it was like the time when like we would say, oh, fuck, the minute you go under your under your shirt sleeve, it's a wrap. You're yeah, fucked. Yeah. Like society will cast you out. You'll never get a job. Yep. And I remember making this decision. I was like, wait a minute. Any job that I want that requires me not to have a tattoo that goes under my sleeve, I don't want. And if I'm getting a job that's serious, I'll have long sleeve anyways. Yeah. So I was like, fuck it. I started tattooing, getting tattooed. But that was still a choice you had to make. There was a line. Now there's no line. It's there's just like, no line. right? It's just like tat your face. Yeah. Um, right out the gate tip of your nose yeah just, tat get the tip. A, just get a tattoo right on it just tattoo the tip of and your then, nose um and also i think that you know there was this explosion of uh you know i think tattoos at some at, i mean there, you know there's a point in new york where tattoos were illegal right it was yeah, like jonathan yeah. shaw was like the only yeah yeah he was crazy man. right um new york i think boston too for a little bit uh it's crazy to think even like i think right now some of the the craziest tattooing all across the board from you know color to micro realism uh, traditional you know heavy black work it's i'm seeing like a lot of i mean it's been going on for like a decade but a lot of stuff coming from korea south korea oh really yeah a lot of korean artists man they're they're, they're crushing it um i'm not quite sure how the process is for them to become tattooers i you know like 
the way that I came in was the proper apprenticeship, you know. Did you have to like wash floors and all that yeah, shit? Yeah, you did. Yeah, clean I puke and they don't even do that anymore, right? No, no, no. It's a different. It's a different age now. And right. I, and like it was the same in like Korea. I was seeing all these artists come out. I don't know if they were coming from shops, but back to the point it was like uh, it was. I don't know if it still is, but tattooing in Korea was illegal. Oh yeah. But I think it was kind of like this gray area where everyone knew it was illegal, but they were still doing it and putting it on Instagram. It's not like, I don't think police were coming to your house and knocking your door down, but to see the growth come from, come from something where all, you know, it was, it was prohibited. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's, I haven't really met many South Korean tattoo artists. I haven't really come across many, but I've seen a lot of their work and man, they're so good. It's, it's crazy. What are they working? Is it are they in black and gray or full color? Everything. Like oh, I've really? seen, like you know, people do stuff that I do, like the you know the the fine line geometric kind of you know mini kind of hyper realistic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of watercolor, a lot of mini color portraits, and like super hyper realism stuff that I'm like I can't even wrap my mind around that kind of shit. Some sick ass trash polka. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But like, and then just like crazy black work where it's like super tribal kind of dot work and patterns. And it's just really impressive. I always see some of that shit. I'll see some, I always see this stuff on Instagram where it's like, it's somewhere, it's some European dude who has a tattoo on his like whole arm of a lion mm. in like the darkest, most dramatic black. I know, I know, I don't know what this style is. It's black and gray, but it's like, it's like. It's like the most dramatic, heavy black and gray where it's like the line. It's, yeah. And the illustration is so the illustration is really good. I would never want that tattoo on me because it's so like I can't explain dramatic. it. It's, like, it's too dramatic. Like it's too the well highlights done. Highlights are super bright. And yeah. the, the, the shadows are super dark. Yeah. It's like out yeah. of control. It's like, you know, yeah. it's like um, it doesn't look it doesn't even look like a tattoo anymore. It looks right. like a really well done, you know, uh, black, uh, you like know, a monochromatic fantasy dream exactly it's like life. right right it's like full fantasy yeah also the subject even like it's like um it's like when you see you know people get like really realistic portraits mm. sometimes they're too realistic for me i'm like i don't want it to, yeah. to be that good you know I, I like i still subscribe to the style where you can kind of tell it's like done by hand you know it's it's perfect it's not perfect it's not too good where you're where you're like man this is like a college trained fine artists you know yeah there's still a bit of grit to it there's still a bit of like wobbliness to it which i still like right because i i do believe that you know tattooing comes from that world yeah uh kind of the outliers and the you know the you know the people that were not typically accepted yeah um and the storytelling of the artwork you know yeah which is kind of some of my stuff is so perfect like not perfect but very clean and the lines are very technical yeah but for me i still really like the the grittiness of it yeah what do you think like if you were to say because now i'm starting to think about you know because i was i was in tattoo world for a long time like i was like wanted to do wanted to do tattoos looked up to tattoo artists i was just like in the, and i was surrounded by that world and i didn't know that it would go to where it went right like mm. Like there's a few tattooers who have gone places that no one thought tattooers would ever go. Yeah. And it's all kind of intermerged where like some tattooers are actual real fine artists as opposed to just yeah. like tattoo fine artists. And like tattooers are moving into other realms, like beyond, you know, fuck what's on TV, yeah. just in the world of of art and commerce. And um like I remember seeing cartoon back in the day when I was a kid and just being like, fuck, I gotta get a, I gotta get a cartoon tattoo. Yeah. And you'd hear the stories, you'd be like, bro, it's a six year wait list. <laughs> you gotta put down $5,000. Yeah. You know, you have to walk the gauntlet. Like it was just like totally. this whole thing. It was so unattainable right. and rare. Right. And uh, reserved for the upper echelon, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you either had to be, you had to know someone or have a yeah a serious bag at your hip because, because you know, it, well, you weren't getting in there, but. That was like my boss, Mark Mahoney. Was, Mark Mahoney. Yeah, it was it was like the creme de la creme. Right. But he was so cool because his whole thing was where the elite and the underworld meet, you know what I mean? So right. it would be Oscar winning actors and then the next, you know, the next point would be some real street kind of right. OG from the block, you know? And yeah. That's an that's the interaction the lore. of that was, was was what's cool because the shop was always like a neutral ground of culture like it didn't oh, yeah. matter who you were there was like a place for you there it was it was an interesting uh place to like 
get to meet a lot of different characters and I didn't think about that. The things. shop is like a cultural kind of like a, a way station for different people to come. Totally. Because everyone has to come there if they want to see this yeah. guy. Even, I mean, at times there were like rivals. Right. Like different neighborhoods and different gang, you know. Right. And there you'd have to be at peace. You right. You know what I mean? Right. It was kind of cool. That's uh, so interesting. Yeah, I mean, that I feel like that's the, that's kind of what, the, sh the best part of a tattoo shop could be is this place that has history. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's a sense of culture. There's, um, there's also a vibe that happens in the clientele intermingling mm. and depending on the different shops. I think now it's like, I think tattooing got really blown out and I think maybe it's kind of, I don't know. Cause I'm not as involved anymore. You yeah. know, I don't really get tattooed much anymore. Cause I'm like, I just, it just hurts. Neither am I. And I, and I make right. tattoos all day, but right. I, I do feel I'm a little out of touch with the scene and the community a bit ever since I left Shamrock. Yeah. But there is a new influx of this new kind of age of tattooers where it is about branding and building like this, you know, this huge machine. Not to say I'm not guilty as part of like dipping my toe in that kind of arena, but the younger, I mean, there was also over 10,000 hours of what I did to get to this point. Yeah. But I do think at entry level for a lot of these tattooers now, it is like straight to closed books. Right. You know, I do this one squiggle thing and, right. you know, you're going to pay me a lot of money for it. Right. And that's, you know, that's not a negative or positive thing to me. It's just a, a new ingredient in, in the way that we do things now. You know, right especially in this this world it just is like we can get angry about these things but you can't fight city no, hall like no you it's can't just the way fight things change go. yeah like, that's yeah. the n number one thing you can hold on to the roots as long as you can but that tree is going to blow over at some point you know yeah but i think also the people that you know the, it's like the people that kind of come up the proper way and have an apprenticeship and fucking clean up the puke and and like they learn a certain they learn to do things in a certain way yeah you really learn how to like the fundamentals of like laying in lines and drawing certain things like you have this like canon that you've built yeah. and and then and then what happens is you have this way of doing things and then the world starts going crazy with something and then you know everyone can get a tattoo machine mm. anyone you don't have to make your own needles you can buy whatever everything's accessible yeah and the world explodes and it seems for a minute that the people that learn the original way are being forgotten, but it always comes back. Yeah. Because people always end up wanting quality. Right? Yeah. And they always want the, they always end up coming back to like the real people that do it, you know? And, um, but now you're, you're in, uh, we were talking about this earlier. You have a residency at the Roosevelt. Well, yeah. I mean, it's more of like um, my good friend Jason over there at the, the hotel group, he, you know, knew I needed a space when I was leaving the shop. Yeah. And I just really, you know, I spent over a decade in a really high activity pace of tattooing and yeah. a lot of colleagues around me, a lot of clients, a lot of, you know, noise. And it was awesome. Like, yeah. it, it wasn't a bad thing. I just wanted, you know, when I started doing my own thing uh, to have like a quieter, just personal studio, you know. So he had this spot. It's not like in the hotel, but it's on the grounds. It's kind of like a, a tucked away little space. And I wanted it just to be like a, a hidden little area. You know, that's why we called it the hideaway. Right. Um, and at Sweet X, because the, the suite is the where we're at. But, you know, I totally rebuilt it. It's it look, it's its own thing and it kind of exists outside of the hotel, you know. Um, so it's my spot. It's, it's kind of like it's cool. You got to go through the hotel to get to it. But it, it's pretty dope. That's kind of sick. Yeah. I mean. Not for nothing, but that's like very, I mean, there's no fucking walk-ins. No walk-ins. No, no Tasmanian devils are getting fucking tattooed in yeah. there. Yeah, like. which is kind of, you know, a little bit of me wishes I can maybe open that part up again. Yeah. Because when you get too comfortable, yeah. like if someone, if you're just doing what you're known for constantly, yeah, it does get a little repetitive and I don't think you're challenged enough to yeah. kind of, you know, progress. Yeah. So I'm... I'm always like, oh man, that would be cool to two Tasmanian devils and like, yeah, you know, tribal butterflies and some something in color, maybe. I don't know. Well, all this shit's come back too, because because like the yeah, new the generation, '90s culture, all yeah. that kitschy shit is like you ironic know, tattoos, right? And, right. 
it's it's weird it's like the more degraded and rudimentary the design now is the more sought after and kind of right. cool but i do think people love the idea of expressing that you don't take things too seriously and that's that's the, the i don't give a fuck part yeah but you give a fuck enough to like make that point so to me it's all kind of ironic but it's, to, but it's fun yeah it's also like i remember when i was when i was younger too and i was really you know really involved with t- like the uh, tattoo world and buying the magazines and like drawing like really kind of focused on it and i would see like rap there was a point where rappers weren't getting tattoos right mm. people don't know this but like tupac was kind of at the forefront uh-huh. of that like there were a few rappers but it was minimal yeah. it wasn't crazy it was like maybe one dude would have a tattoo on their arm it wasn't blown out no tupac came out and you know i'm sure he wasn't the first but that kind of ushered this wave of rappers getting tattooed and then all the ball players are getting tattooed mm-hmm. and i remember seeing i would see these dudes get tattooed and i'll be like i'd be like damn that's those tattoos are bad mm-hmm. right and i didn't understand because I was just, I was, it was banged in my head about that you have to get a tattoo done right. It's got to be done this way. And this is a good tattoo. And that's a shit tattoo. Like mm. scratchers do this. And it's, it was banged in my head that there's only one way to do it. But then hindsight being 2020, you realize that people getting tattoos that are bad represents like it's regional. So you're yeah. getting tattoos in your home state by the local dude. That's the homie. You're going to get a fucked up tattoo because yeah. you're not seeking out, you know, and like, and I used to be hyper focused on like getting the best tattoos and like I gotta get this guy and that guy and I would, I, I gotta get one from so and so and like and then you know now I'm looking at it, I was like who gives a shit yeah yeah, <laughs> like, yeah yeah like you know what get whatever tattoo you want to get because totally. it's it's totally it's a free for all yeah. right I mean at the time it was just access it's like you know I learned how to tattoo in Hollywood in Los Angeles that's such a specific high concentrated yeah cultural exchange you know what if you are in the midwest in some small town like right. you only have certain access to what you can get and i and you know it wasn't so much about the perfection or the art it's about kind of marking your body and aligning yourself in with this kind of like i'm, I'm on this side of the line now you know yeah and you know i don't think there's a lot of people that i don't maybe not now but they weren't getting tattoos decided on if the tattoo was good or not it was more about the message that they were sending by having that mark on their body 100 percent, yeah well here's the thing i'm doing an ad read and someone screenshotted the ad read and screenshotted a program notice over the ad read so thank you whoever did that and it's either one of two people alex or jason i don't know who the fuck did it but i will have your fucking head Here's the thing. I don't want to use this paper because I use Green Chef and the great thing, I'm just going to talk, I'm going to go off the cuff. Okay. I'm just going to talk here about Green Chef. I'll let you guys know. I use it. Okay. I've used it in my life. I go on the website. I pay the fee. Easy to navigate website. I pick a meal plan. Wonderful meals. Chicken, beef, pork, pork chops. I made pork chops. I never made pork chops in my entire life until I got Green Chef. Then I made some motherfucking pork chops. And you know what? It was delicious. I didn't even like pork except for bacon. I like the pork chops. They have all, they have bagogi. Okay. And I'm talking about keto paleo bagogi. So I use this thing and, uh, and I order the meals and they come pre-packaged and everything has a perfectly served out uh, amount of 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 ingredient to cook the pepitas you know you roast those sometimes the little seeds uh just the right amount of turmeric for your chicken for your maple turmeric chicken uh just the right amount of chicken uh that i don't wash in the sink uh, if some of you are longtime listeners first time callers and podcast lovers you know that episode's about anyways um yeah, I use Green Chef and I make these little meals and I try to plate them just like they do in the picture. And I can make a meal that looks palatable and isn't disgusting like most of the other food I eat. Left to my own devices, when I cook at home, it's a fucking nightmare. It's a goddamn horror show. I whip up a bunch of shit, I put it on a plate, I scarf it down, I'm an animal. I have no sense of, of, of prepping, plating, or presentation. But with Green Chef, not only can I make delicious meals, but I can plate them and it makes me look like I know what the fuck I'm doing. Like there's some sense of normalcy and and peace in, in my life in the kitchen, which it's really not. It's kind of crazy. Um, Green, Green Chef is the first USDA certified organic meal kit. So you can enjoy hand-picked organic veggies and premium proteins without having to worry where they came from. That means someone's going out picking the food and prepping it for you. They're hunting and gathering, picking and arranging for you. You don't have to do that. Welcome to the new reality where your food comes 
pre-prepped and picked so you can whip it up in your pan or pot and serve it to yourself and your girlfriend or your boyfriend or for yourself just to watch Dune on TV. We didn't even talk about Dune. I watched Dune. We're going to talk about that next episode. I saw the movie Dune. I might watch it again before we speak because I have a lot of thoughts. Um, Green Chef is also the most sustainable meal kit, offsetting 100% of the plastic use and 100% of the carbon footprint and emissions. Enjoy your greens while being green. Avoid the long lines at the grocery store and get fresh premium ingredients delivered right to your door. And since Green Chef's ingredients are pre-portioned, which I talked about, You'll be reducing food waste by at least 25 motherfucking percent. It is also America's number one meal kit for eating well. Think about it. If America's number one, and this is the number one meal kit in America, it might be the number one meal kit in the universe. Ponder that shit. Speaking of Dune, uh, the Gum Jabbar, Quizak Satarak, and Green Chef, all in one thing. They're the best meal kit, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, pescatarian, or just want to eat more balanced wheels. More, ugh, just want to eat more balanced meals. Uh, I use it. It's great. It looks great. It's delicious. And I love it. It's, it's part of my life. Um, go to greenchef.com slash PTA125 and use code PTA125 to get $125 off, including free shipping. Go to greenchef.com slash PTA125 and use code PTA125 to get... $125 off, including free shipping. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. There's something for everyone. I love it. Once again, uh, go to greenchef.com slash PTA125 and use code PTA125 to get $125 off, including free shipping. And I also have to apologize for eating on camera on the last episode. If you've gotten this far in the show, because I'm recording this ad read at the end of the show, but if you've gotten this far, I fucking ate my breakfast on, on the show. And I've been told that that's disgusting. Shout out to Uncle Pauly. He comes up to me. He goes, like, he goes like, you're fucking chewing on the air. And I'm like, you're right. And I, I'm making amends, especially to that person, because it's disgusting. I listened to it in the car the other day, one of the rare times I listened to the show. And I was eating on, I, just Alex, protect me from me. Okay, Jason, Jason's not even here, but you guys protect me from myself and don't let me eat a meal on the fucking air. It's disgusting. I hate that I was able to, I hate that I did that. And I thought it was just funny. I thought it would be great to just eat while I talk. It's not, it's horrible. And I'll explain to you guys why I do that because my schedule is so tight that sometimes I'm coming in, coming in hot and leaving hot and I have to get food in me. Otherwise I'll just stop uh, operating in the middle of the show. Apologies again. I'm never going to eat on the air again. I might drink some gross juice. I might have some water and coffee, but I'm never going to eat a meal on this mic. I made that. And you guys hold me, Alex, don't let me do it. Okay. Did you apprentice at, at Under Mahoney? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Mark Mahoney, he's such a character himself. Yeah, he's a, he's a legend, know, man. He, right? He was like the first guy that I saw, you know, and I was like, wow, that's, I don't, I've never seen someone like this before growing yeah. up, you know, kind of like in the Gore Hills. And, that's you where know, you grew up yeah, in Agora? Yeah. I was oh. born in North Hollywood, but I grew up in like Gore Hills. I grew up skateboarding and working no at shit. skate shops. Yeah, that was like my background. Fuck, dude. These Agora, these Agora boys. There's, <laughs> I'm telling you, the Agora, there's so many Agora heads yeah. that have like over the years, because like you see a lot of these guys and they're in these prominent positions in all these different industries. Like Agora heads have slowly just done shit. Yeah. You know, like Aaron Levant. Of course. an Agora head. Yep, um, yep. Shout out to Aaron and um, I mean, there's there's Tollywood. I mean, Tollywood's in the yeah, head, right? I know Tal. You know, you know Tal. Yeah, yeah, um, of course. But there's like even just pro skateboarders, like yeah. uh, you know, so many pro skateboarders come from Agora. Musicians, like so many successful bands right. have come from there. Which but, one of the Amber? Which which band? Which uh, one of those '90s kind of like seminal Amber is the color bands? Was, oh uh, yeah. The guy that had Not all the red. Eleven, but no, the other uh, Brandon. His name was. He had tattoos. Red uh, tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're uh, Gura guys. Incubus. Right? Incubus. Yeah, Incubus. Incubus is a Gura yeah, all day. Yeah. That's a Gura. Um, I think it's honestly, to be honest, since I'm from it, it's the proximity to the inner city, right? You can, yeah. You can drive from the burbs to the heart of downtown in 45 minutes. Yeah. And then you have the protective layer where people from downtown don't really drive 45 minutes up to where you live. They don't know where the fuck it is. No. So you have you have the freedom and the comfortability yeah. of a middle class, upper class family yeah. upbringing yeah. with access to culture and the grittiness of the streets if you want. Right. If you want to intermingle. And I do think the exposure to that and being able to have a little bit of support just the way you grew up 
Yeah, it's helpful. It's helpful. I mean, it's... 100%. You know? It's like people from... It's like you can come into the city and figure out what's going on, but not get caught up in it. Because 100%. if you're from the city... You're really you're, living. You're in it. And like a lot of dudes don't get out of it. No. <laughs> right. It's rare for guys from a neighborhood to actually like make it out of that neighborhood. It's it's super totally. rare. But like that's why people from other people from outside of LA come in. And Agora is like, in my opinion, like now, seeing so you know, how things are progressing. When I was a kid, I was like, fuck it, I'm from I'm from the west side. Agora's over here. And I'll yeah. go to Agora and think I was all fucking cool and shit because I grew up, you know, in Venice. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Now I'm like, if you're, I'm just happy you're within the sphere of fucking, if you're in the circle of LA. Yeah. Cause so many people come from outside of other states and come here and they navigate LA in a way because they don't have the, there's no, uh, there's no connection to it and there's no emotion connected to it. So they can navigate it and be like, okay, I'll use this, I'll use that, I'll do mm -hmm. that. You know what I mean? And for us, it's like, it's different because it's, it's, there's so many more, um, so many more strings attached. Yeah. And there's so much more like, like I think that, Coming up in a place, you're you're also scared to do things because you don't want to be the odd man out. Yeah. And you're like, well, what are these guys are gonna think I'm lame if I do this? And so you're kind of trapped in this weird thing. Yeah. Um, but I think I think coming from outside or like coming from the burbs, quote unquote, and coming into the city, you're like, you can like access it and then you can go home and like have some peace. Totally. Right. And it yeah. doesn't, yeah. You don't get tripped up in the bullshit. Yeah. And it's funny because as a kid, you know, a lot of us and my crew and people I was friends with, everyone wanted to get out of there, right? Yeah. They wanted to get, make it in the city and yeah. be an artist or a musician. When all the kids that we were hanging out with were like, I want to get out of my neighborhood yeah. the opposite way, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it was, you know, as when I get older, of course I look back like, yeah, I was really fortunate. And it, you know, I probably wasn't as hard as I thought it was, you know, just, yeah. just like with the, like the way we grew up, but I can I, I can say that's probably the same for a lot. Of but people. then dudes in Agora, like I, there's a lot of guys from my graffiti crew in Agora yeah. from there from Agora. And then what happened was in the '90s, this is crazy. In the '90s, um, gangbanging became so prolific that fools started gangbanging in Agora, kind of as a joke. And then it turned real. There was, no, it was you remember real. Gremlins? You remember? Bro, I was just gonna say Gremlins and like, <laughs> dude, there was there was a lot of crazy shit going down. No, they started like shooting each other. Yeah, and shit. there was, I was a lot like, of. I remember doing? all that stuff, dude. Yeah, it took a couple. It took a couple boys. I know I'm not gonna say any names, but a couple a couple guys from the boys' home came in and started fucking things up, and then. And then like, you know, it's all, it's all fun and games. And Everyone's like, we're, we're from a gang. Yeah. And they're like, well, guess what? We got to start shooting each other. It's like, what the fuck? Dude, it was crazy. Yeah. I remember like, once you go past like off Canaan, it was like, you know, I got, I was hanging out with some kids that were friends with in that scene. We got jumped by like Nazis before. Yeah. I've been, I seen like all in Agora. Like, I was, oh, yeah. it was like a crazy, I've seen some pretty rough, small battles there, you know? Oh Yeah. It totally died off later, like when we started skateboarding more, but it totally trickled. And then it, every kid had like a cousin that was from a gang. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like my cousin, you know, Oscar, yep. you know, from from there. And then he would come up and his like Nissan Altima with like all his homies and then run the Agora kids because they're all just like, oh, wow, these yes. guys are from a real gang, you know? Yeah. And then then they'd start going to school in the pro clubs and the Dickies and like this shit's Cortez's, real. you know? Listen, I used to believe when, when they used to say that music and movies influence kids, I'd be like, bullshit. But then I saw it happen. I saw rap, I saw American Me hit a girl, and I saw a couple couple rappers, and like fools started, I mean, it, like overnight. It was like, Dude, fools, we're gangbanging. The first tattoo that I ever got was with my friend Chris, and we were in seventh grade, and we learned hand poking tattoos from watching Mi Vida Loca. Right. Now see, remember like yeah, yeah. when they were tapping and we're like, oh shit, you can oh, we do, could that? do that? And then we like went and did it and started tapping fucking three dots on our like ankles and shit, like idiots and initials and like all this stuff. And that was like like the first time I was exposed to, you know, marking your skin. But it was from that movie. That's so interesting. You know? And then of course, once you kind of like, oh, we watch this movie and then like Chris is like, oh, but you know, my cousin has like a machine in his garage and right. like he's friends with this guy from this guy. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh cool, we're connected somehow, but we're not, you know what I mean? Is that how it started for you? Yeah, I think I was like 12. And you saw me Vita Loca and you're like, I'm gonna, yeah, bro. crazy. Or like that. I mean, I like the movie we're like, oh shit, this is crazy. But yeah. 
the actual application, like, is that real? Like, can you right. really do that? And we did it. And then. And it stayed. And you're like, yeah. oh, shit. And then you start, out. you know, going and looking at all the tattoo magazines. Right. And then you start noticing more movies. And then. God forbid a teen angel gets up to a girl and all of a sudden no, it's like. No, dude. That was like one of the first things I saw was all the teen angels and shit. Right. All the pencil sketches and the yeah. handkerchiefs and like all that stuff. And I mean. I mean mind boggling. I remember, I remember the first time I started seeing them and I was like, you know, at the liquor stores and shit. And I get oh, a crack yeah. open a teen angel and be like, what, what the is fuck? this? I'm like, what are these cars? And yeah. why are they going up and down like that? And yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, at Shamrock, we had like such a good collection of oh, yeah. mags just for reference and stuff you know and then just a lot of real shit that people were sending you know alexis, from, alexis you know? used to send his pictures in to teen angel under on his name was private he'd be like private dancer <laughs> and he'd send in like he'd take a picture at, at the swap meet like in the full kit no with the airbrushing and put like and put like in immaculate gang letters like you know, essay private dance or blah, 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 and like send the picture and they would make it they, to the magazine, like really old issues. Oh my like, God. Because he's, you know, that he's been, it's just been kind of his thing for so long. Yeah. Kind of being obsessed with, with that culture, you know? I mean, I mean it's, about, yeah. And then you find out about Greenspans and then you yeah. go down there and you're like, yeah. Wearing, like, it, was, yeah. it was amazing, dude. Yeah. Well, it's like, it, it's crazy too, because you just, I remember as a kid drawing. I remember as a kid being a drawing and, and, and drawing like I was drawing ninjas, right? And and uh and I remember like I started I just started soaking up my environment and being like, what is I see this like Dogtown Cross mm-hmm. and like V13 and shit. And I just started drawing it because it was around me. Yeah. And then I see graffiti in Venice and I'd be like, and I just like I just got morphed into it. And I turn around one day and I'm just drawing graffiti. And I'm like, and I go, I met up with this old friend of mine, and I'm like, Cause we used to draw, we used to draw ninjas together as little kids. And I'm like, what are you drawing? He's like, I'm into drawing this and I'm into baseball cards. And I'm like, I'm into this. Yeah. And it's like, we looked at each other and we're like, we're not friends anymore. Cause yeah. like, he didn't understand what the fuck I was doing. I was like, fuck baseball cards. It's about this. Yeah. You know? And, um, it's just crazy that like, you know, kids, we just, you know, you latch onto these things. Like I, you know, when I started doing graffiti, like you're, you're inking dots on people as a kid. Cause you saw it somewhere. You have no concept of where that's going to take no, you. No, no. No con. Like, you're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And and I did the same shit. I'm like, I'm doing graffiti. And, like, it took me two places that I would have never imagined. I had no, I didn't, I, all I wanted to do was, like, be good at this thing. Yeah. I want to be good at graffiti, and I want I want these other 15-year-old boys to to respect me. Like, totally. that's, all, that's all I wanted. Like, you know, yeah. I want to be fucking all city, or I want to be whatever. And same thing with you, right? You wanted to tattoo because you thought it was cool. And then. Yeah. Well, like once I started doing it and then we, you know, I started getting tattooed very young, like underage, right? Going to how shops old, and how shit. How old were you? I think I got my first real tattoo, like from the machine at a shop when I was like 14 years old. No shit. Yeah. Where'd your parents Off say? Melrose. Man, I, I, I was uh, a wild, wild youth. And I think is the combination of, um, you know, they immigrated here. I'm first born. I'm first generation. They were working their ass off. I was like no connection to my uh, parents at all, you know? Yeah. Just because they were working and I was trying to chase this kind of uh, uh, acceptance, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I wanted to, what the things that I thought were cool, I wanted to be known for and being respected in that. But I also was like, yo, I'm like this fucking Asian kid from the burbs essentially right, right right but i'm into all this other shit and so when i got yeah they were i just didn't give a fuck i was i really didn't give a shit i remember i got my tattoo and <laughs> we were at christmas in the bay visiting my dad's family you know they live all in chinatown up there and it was a dragon on my ankle um and i remember just pulling it up and showing them like look what i got just kind of like to fuck with them i don't know yeah, yeah yeah just like a little piece of shit you know yeah and they're just like kind of not even surprised they're like yeah whatever and at school they started telling me to put pants on during pe because it was such a distraction that this like ninth grader had like this fucking tattoo on his yeah, leg. that's wild and at that time that was unheard of like, wild back in the, i think it was the 90s i don't know how yeah. to do the data back but no kid had like tattoos right no way and i just knew like being around it that i really wanted it to get more like i really right. want to get more and i wanted to hang out with these guys because to me it was like this lifestyle of freedom and not really giving a shit about anything outside of that right and i knew they were to me scary like i knew these were like scary kind of dudes it right. wasn't just some shit you mess around with right huh. um you're really drawn to it yeah but i didn't even want to do tattoos because i didn't feel worthy enough to be in that world i was like 
these are like people that are like born in a tattoo shop literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. right yeah. like literally born with a tattoo machine in their yeah. hand and you can trace their lineage back like so far who am i to like be part of this yeah but you know it didn't come until later like after almost uh, like nine years of getting tattoos before i even you know nine years starting at 14 but before i even thought about doing it right and i never even thought about doing it until mahoney was like yo have you ever thought about being an apprentice like you are an art you're an artistic kid and you're creative because you were getting tattooed there yeah i was getting tattooed by mark forever oh and hanging out with shamrock like i hung out there for a long time you're just hanging out before... but you didn't have aspirations you were just hanging no, out i was trying to do fucking start a clothing brand and i was oh, skating yeah. you know i was like part of the skate world i was right. managing the skate shop managing a skate team i wanted i was like somewhat into fashion and creative design like i didn't but I wanted to get fucking just blasted. Right, right, so I went out of the tattoo shop. And then when he offered that, I was like, oh shit. Like in my mind, I was like, this is, I don't want to be a doctor, but if Harvard was like, hey, 100%. you want a scholarship to learn how to be a doctor? I'd be like, or a lawyer. Yeah. I'm like, okay, like, yeah. I'm not going to turn that opportunity down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where it started. And then I realized like being a good tattoo artist is so much more than just being good at drawing or being good at art. There's like, a whole lifestyle and like a code of ethics and it's the tattooing the actual art of tattooing itself is probably like the last part of tattooing as a culture you know what i mean yeah there's so much more to it than that bit the execution yeah. is just like the cream at the, the cherry on top you know? right yeah I, I i had the same i had uh i had dropped out of school i was fucking around and then I just got to the point where I started getting my shit together. And I got, I, I went, I dropped out of high school and then I got myself into a film school. And at the same time, I was offered an apprenticeship because I was still hanging out at the shop. And I was like, that was like my dream was like, I, I never thought I could be a tattoo artist. And then I did something else and forgot about that. And then they offered it to me and I was like, I couldn't say no because it was something I always wanted, but I'd already moved past it into like another thing. Well, not past, but parallel, right? So now I was in school and I'm still, you know, and they're like, hey, do you want an apprentice? And I couldn't say no to it. So I took the apprenticeship while I was in school. And I didn't finish school and I didn't finish the apprenticeship because, uh, you know, the tattooing, um, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, like applying a tattoo on someone is like, it's a very blue collar trade. Mm, like it's not yeah. fun. You know, like yeah. doing that job is like, like, the, you know, guys laying in fucking whole arms and backs. It's like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. You might as well be laying pipe or some shit. Like it yeah. is, it is like you're fabricating, you know, totally. like the drawing. Like, it's, it's a trade. It's a, it's a artisanal craft. Yeah. I always said right. it was a craft before it was an art. Right. That's just how I was brought into it. You right. Know? Yeah. Working like the in fun a street tattoo shop. Yeah. And the fun part is drawing, imagining, talking, and the actual laying in is like, fuck. Yeah. The technical side is tough. You know, yeah. some people enjoy it and I still see, you know, a lot of tattoo artists and they're just like loving it. And in my mind, I'm like, I feel a little guilty at times because I could be in the middle of tattoo going like, I just wish this is, I can just end this now. Right. Like, I, I want to stop. I also have like this attention span of like yeah. an hour or two hours. Like older I get, the worse it's getting. 100%. Um, so... I totally get what you mean, man. There's, there is, each tattoo is different though. There are ones that are obviously fun and you you feel very gratified and kind of uh, like a full circle feeling of completion when you do it. Yeah. And there are other ones that are laying pipe or, you know, being a blacksmith or being, yeah. sorry, being a plumber. Being a blacksmith, or, yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. something you're good at and you know, you know you're good at it, yeah. but at times you do lose a bit of soul. And I also think just dealing with other people in general is like, some people just have this energy that kind of completely shifts the direction of where you're going while you're doing a tattoo. You know? Oh, right. What do you mean? Like, just like, you know, someone's super picky, someone's super oh, annoying, right. someone's expectations are like, they're forgetting, like, yo, you're literally uh, taking some liquid and I'm using a fucking metal needle and I'm pushing right. it into your super, you know, watery skin or dry right. skin, whatever. Like, it's yeah. a, it's a, what we're doing here is like an interesting bond. It's not like this laser printed. Right, right, right. You know, digital artwork, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've seen some motherfuckers that can do that shit now. Yeah. That I'm like, how? Yeah. But there's no way that it's enjoyable. You know what I mean? And if yeah. they do find joy in it, fucking more praise to them. Maybe I'm just a bit salty, but. 
Well, this your. I mean, as a tat, you, this is part of being a tattooer is that you have to be salty. Yeah. Every there's no. I don't think there is a good tattooer that isn't salty. <laughs> no. Like doing that many tattoos, yeah. dealing with that many people, you become you become chafed and you become kind of like. Um, you're just you're just like a little burnt. I forget the word when you're just like what does it mean when you're burnt out emotionally? It's just people. Um, jaded or you jaded? Yeah, you just yeah, become yeah. jaded. Yeah. Not like a dick, but you just kind of like yeah. I've seen pretty. I've had every conversation I can have. I've seen everything, and I've had so many people come up to me and be like, "I want a dolphin, but he's holding a coffee. And he has a baseball hat, and also has a rainbow. And there's yeah. also a streamer coming out. But the dolphin should be happy, kind of sad. You're like, just get a fucking dolphin. Yeah, right? yeah. Just get, I learned that pretty soon. I was like. Just go, when you get a tattoo, it's like, just give me like a fucking skull and this is it. Like, yeah. I don't, don't tell me what, you know, cause it makes you guys crazy. Totally. You know. But um, I but I also like, you know, I try my best to always put my feet in their shoes and be like, yo, they probably don't. This is like maybe their second time in a tattoo shop in their whole life. Yeah. And the, te- the thing that we kind of preach with tattooing is like, it's on your skin forever. Yeah. So, you know, people are like, this is good. This is a serious thing. Yeah. I get it, you know, and I try to respect that for sure because they're giving me money and the, you know, they're respecting my career and they're helping me live. So I, I do try to walk both sides of that coin. Yeah. But after, you know, I'm 40 now, like after a minute doing this, I can only be honest and say I do get jaded at times and yeah. a little frustrated. But that's the key to doing anything that you like, I think, is you got to step out for a bit, find what makes you love about it and try to trigger those those bits a little bit more. I'm in this phase now where I have begun to start trying to build other things in my life and career wise that I want to go back. And anytime I do something with tattooing is utilize that time to really trying to just grow at it and stop not being and just not doing what I know I can knock out the park, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, and back to your because you, you know, you've had a you've had a trajectory which is pretty <laughs> Pretty crazy, I think. Um, I mean, still, just like the the thing at the Roosevelt's wild, right? I mean, I think that's pretty wild. You're probably over it, like you're like, okay, that's where I work, but like I'm like, that's pretty wild. <laughs> um, and you know, you 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 apprentice under Mahoney. You worked at that shop for what a decade, you said? Yeah, in, including apprentice. I mean, I probably was there for over twelve years. And then you started, and six years ago, you moved into the Roosevelt. And is that? Around the same time that you start, because you've branched into all these other things, right? Yeah. You have all these other like lines of revenue, products. You're doing, you know, collabs with people. Like you're fucking, you're doing something with Porsche. Like I always see you doing something with Porsche all the time. Yeah. Like yeah. what do you, how does that, how does, that's fucking nuts. How does that work? I mean, I think for me, the, even before tattooing, like I was saying, I was already super into branding. Like I wanted to, you know. Right start a clothing brand and and work in that creative space uh art you know is my first love so anything artistic and i was getting frustrated because none of those when you're like young early 20s and you're like i want to buy a house and a nice car how yeah. am i going to do that selling drawings or right. selling t-shirts what this is pre-instagram pre-e-commerce essentially yeah where you had to you had to find someone to invest in you and then have a showroom and right. have orders and all that shit to even make it, right? Um, so like the tattooing thing was like a cool kind of stop in the in the momentum and like, all right, I'm just gonna, I never, never ever in my life listened to anyone. I dropped out of high school. I didn't graduate on time. Like I was kind of just like a rebellious kid that was, I would like to say too smart for my own good, but maybe I wasn't, right? Yep. Um, and I, Tattooing the apprenticeship was college for me. Like, yep. That's where I'm like, I'm going to start literally at the bottom here. Get, you know, thrown in, in the situation that I was in. I won't get too into it. But like how my apprenticeship started, I was literally thrown into like the, the pool of sharks. Right. It was like my second day. I was like, oh, I'm running this shit. Uh, that's it now. OK. And I had to go. And, you know, do what you do you mean? mean? What were you running? Like it was just I never done anything in a tattoo shop before right. and the guy that was kind of like training me just dipped like he's like all right yeah i pass you the torch and then he just left i don't know something happened upstairs but right internally but i was like left to answer the phones clean the tubes make the appointments for like nine artists that were all heavy heavy heavily respected right uh, tattoo artists in the world sink and, or swim right you know and they and they yeah. weren't they're some were nice and some were cool but like yo to be a legit yeah, tattoo yeah, artist yeah. you got you you got sharp elbows you know yeah, what i mean yeah yeah 
So, you know, if I did something wrong, if I didn't do something right, it was like the end of the world. So, I mean, there was times in that apprenticeship where I'm like, I'm never going to be tattooed. I mean, there was fools looking at me going, you're never going to tattoo, bro. What are you doing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now fucking go grab me some beer. Like that kind of shit. And I was like, oh man, am I really not going to do this? Yeah. So any kind of legitimacy in that world that (laughs) I felt that is lost. And I know like now it seems a little more polished, my image and my brand, but like I was fucking in the, in in the gutter yeah. with with that shit so i'm like super proud i can never no one can ever take that shit away from me in the yeah. tattoo world like yeah. i earned that shit and at, at the time i didn't think of anything else like i didn't think of branding i didn't think of anything i was like i my goal is just to be a tattoo artist not even a, the best tattoo artist not even right. a, a great tattoo artist it's just to be a tattoo artist and sit here at shamrock and do tattoos yeah and eventually i did and uh but I still also was me and I had all my own interests and my, my, you know, my network was with a lot of creative friends growing up. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of people outside of the tattoo world that I knew that I, you know, collaborated with already. So it was kind of like this natural progression. Once I found my feet a little bit in tattooing, it was like, okay, cool. Let's do this other stuff that maybe brings in the tattoo side, tattoo side of me into this new world. Um, and slowly but surely it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And, in the end, the success of, you know, the, and the timing of what I did kind of opened a lot of doors back into what I originally would wanted to do before tattooing into the creative space, into like the branding and stuff. And, um, you know, that's where I'm now. And, and one of the biggest lessons I learned was at the time of becoming a tattoo, a tattoo artist and also in my late teens, like in the skate world, everything was just about being down, like core as fucking hardcore as you can be yeah. and not giving a fuck about the future. You just be you 100% and never sell out. Nothing, like everything was about like, I'm gonna grind till the day I die yeah. and be down. But once you hit a certain age, you gotta let your dreams change. Your dream at like in your early 20s doesn't always have to be your dream that you get to, you know? Yeah. So later on, I was like, man, I kind of have new dreams that yeah. I wanna do. Yeah. And the hardest thing for me was being able to let myself accept that as truth right. instead of just being like, oh, shit, I'm just like I'm changing out of the person that I was. Right. You know what I mean? Things change and you yeah. got to like be able to. Yeah, you got your dream you, too. you got to you know? be a little flexible, malleable with things. It doesn't mean you can't. I think there's certain things you hold on to, like this is a goalpost, but yeah. everything around it, you have to be like, well, okay, wait a minute. I, you have to change how you think also. For sure. Like every 10 years, you should be, you, you should have a new perspective, you know, yeah. at minimum. I guess right? that's just growing as a person. Yeah, but a lot, some, if you're lucky enough to grow as a person, some people yeah. don't. Some people are still thinking the same way they thought they were at 13. And yeah. They're, they're stuck. Right? Totally. So, and I'm like, you know, I'm constantly trying to tear it down and rebuild it because I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. I'm like, do my best, you know, but. Um, but we I, have our set values that won't right. change no matter what exactly it's just being able to allow allow other things to to change with us right. you know what i mean like with how we think about things yeah because there's always going to be that in my mind like i'm always gonna be down i'm never gonna like sell my soul the same way that i thought i would. you know what i mean like yeah it's a little different yeah i mean it's i mean i think that we're probably lucky to be in these spaces that we are in because it's you know, we're surrounded by all these people doing these things and you kind of, it's hard to see out of it a lot. Mm. Like this guy's doing this, this guy's doing this, but like, that's not the rest of the world isn't doing that. So you kind of get, you get in this bubble. Um, so for your apprenticeship, how long did you have to shovel shit before you got to do a tattoo? It's probably like two years. Two years? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was two years of like making stencils and cleaning tubes and all that shit. Yeah, man. That's crazy. So they made you that like, was like standard, yeah. you know, like when people there's so many people that have come and go like tattoo artists that are pretty prominent now that are out there that I said to my face, like, Psst, I'm not doing that. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's like, OK, yeah, like I don't think two year <laughs> apprenticeships exist anymore. I think no, you just not like, now you just pull up and just pull out your machine. And, you know, things change, man. You yeah. got, and that's part of accepting there, I, you know. To be fair, I'm still, I could be a little bit salty still about that shit, but I am learning to let go of that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to compare myself to every fucking tattoo artist. Like, oh, you never did it the right way. Like, I did it the right way. You know, because I changed in that world too. Yeah. Um, And it is just different. Like, it's the same with everything that we do. I mean, even photography. I have so many friends that are photographers that are, you know, did the same kind of thing, apprentice and like put in hard time. And now you got some kid that can take a sick iPhone photo, you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. like, 
buy a cool Leica with these lenses and YouTube tutorial on how to shoot uh, fashion photography or product photography. And honestly, I, you know, that those tutorials are getting pretty in depth and yeah. a motherfucker can learn that shit in a week and compete against you and you have to just deal with it. But what I think that you're saying is at the end though, people are always going to go back to, you can't fake experience and you can't, you can't, you can fake talent, yeah. but I don't think you can fake experience and time, you know? I think so. I think that the standout, you know, people that are really good at their craft are always going to be working if yeah. they want to, you know? Yeah. And, but yeah, you just have to navigate like the world, you know, the world's changing whether or not you want it to. And that's just kind of the way it is. Um, what was it like? Okay. The first time you got to do a tattoo, right? Mm. They were like, okay, try one. Yeah. Right. Like you must've just been like, holy shit, today's the day. Dude, and, I, I was like, I got this. I've been in this fucking shop every day for two years. Yeah. Watching Mark, he, Freddie Negretti, like. Everyone's and you're surviving off of tips and shit, right? And like, yeah. Oh, you had a job. Th too. They had a good. They had a good uh, system there because Shamrock was so busy, man. Like yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. job. Like running the front of that shop. Yeah. Working for nine artists. Yeah, crazy. Doing their books, doing their appointments, wrapping, cleaning, all that shit. Like you, you know, you're not going to keep anyone doing that job for just yeah. like whatever. So there was like a, a little tip out payout at the end of the day that i mean i you know i had a little one bedroom studio actually not one bedroom a studio apartment and like off melrose right but i was also like 20 you know early 20s I, I didn't need much yeah and you know i did that um what was your real question uh when they first let you oh when i first got a tattoo, tattoo. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah um so like, yeah, after two years of seeing it constantly, seeing how their hand movement works, you know, setting up their machines too. Yeah. I was setting up Freddie's machines, like hanging the needle out there too, right. like setting all the liners and shaders up. So you thought you knew, man. And then, you know, the first tattoo I did, it was St. Patrick's Day. You yeah. Know, fucking Irish pride at that shop. Oh, so yeah. that was like a big day for us. People will come get, you know, $20 shamrocks or whatnot. And it was my turn, you know, they're like, hey, woo. You can do it. You can do a tattoo, and I was like, in my mind, I'm like, I fucking got this. I'm gonna crush like, this. I'm gonna fucking crush this <laughs> shit. And I did it. You know, I did it at Mark Station. There was a, a homie from like Thousand Oaks that came through, yeah. and like on his ankle. And I don't, I, I don't know how it went, but that shit was hard as fuck. Like yeah. the figuring out the balance, and you know, stretching the skin, and yeah. And then the gravity of like, oh shit, like this is gonna be on here forever. Forever. Like, you know, it wasn't as easy as I thought. And then, then a couple more tattoos happened. You know, I think on Mondays I was allowed to tattoo my friends. Right. Which I was pretty fortunate enough. Like I didn't have to practice on like pig skin or anything because I had a lot of homies that were like, Damn. I got an empty spot on my ankle and it'll be a funny story one day if it sucks. So who yeah. cares, right? Yeah. And never underestimate how many people actually get a free tattoo no matter if it's bad or good oh hell yeah <laughs> so you know there's a couple i'm actually like oh shit i'm the next thing like this is for my fourth tattoo this is pretty good yeah and then, then there's one that's like oh my god like i have no business doing this this is <laughs> yeah, like yeah. the worst thing i think that he's gonna have to go to the hospital you know this, <laughs> the skin's all fucked up right um and that's just like that back and forth you know and that's just it still happens sometimes. I'm remembering. <laughs> right? I did. I did a few, and I did this one on this kid. It was like you know, prime '90s and like full graffiti '90s style. Like it was like a cholo devil pulling a shotgun out of his shirt with Sick. brownies on and like Cortez, and it was like this big on this kid's arm. It's still there. I I used to run into him once in a while. I'd be like, check this out. Like, Holy shit, you know. And like I it, and but everything too that I did was like. It had that full like warped 90s look where like everything's all like stretched. Uh -huh. you, like all the eyes are big and everything's all ah. Sick. It's like, you it, like it'd be on a Jinko leg sleeve graphic. Yeah, a little better than that. <laughs> I like to think, but like definitely, definitely had that influence, you know, yeah. like definitely it was time stamped. I think I did like a skull on this dude's knee. Like I, you know, I was out there just going for it. And I mean, it was, you know, it's just, it's tough, man. Like it was like, the sanitation stuff was crazy yeah. you know like doing dealing with all that stuff it was like fuck you know it was like that was just getting in my head from the jump i mean i didn't i ended up not staying there for like they a bunch of reasons why i didn't stay there um but i just didn't i didn't end up pursuing it but i just remember i don't know like being 
being there and just being like, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this is going to work. You know, yeah. like, this is like, there's other things that I want to do. And this is a full-time gig. Like I couldn't like, yeah. par- I couldn't part-time tattoo. No. There's no way. And that's know? what I'm saying. Like back in that time. Yeah. To break into this business. Yeah. It's, it was a, the, the tightest fraternity globally. Yeah. That you'd you give ever, your life to that it. you'd ever see like Horyoshi the third yeah, yeah, yeah. would send like emissaries to Shamrock that would bow and give Mark like these signed paintings. And it was like all, all about respect. Yeah. No scratchers, no kitchen wizards, no yeah. like, you know, at home guys. Yeah. Like if you worked from your garage, you were like piece of shit. You, yeah, yeah. In the in the tattoo community, they yeah. were not. You yeah, know, that no, means, that's what I was taught. I was banging in my head like exactly. scratchers, people that do out of the house. Like, what the fuck, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I don't prescribe to this way of thinking, subscribe to this way of thinking now, but like the, the term self taught yeah. tattooing was like a no. big. Did someone ever started off their sentence like that? Yeah, it was yeah. a big. They get like, the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bro. Yeah. I'll nod with you, but in my in my heart, I'm yeah, like, yeah. you know, you 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 you're a toy. You know, like yeah. you're, you're nothing. Oh, but now there's some self taught artists that I'm like this might be the best tattooer of all time. You know right. what I mean? I'm like, how? There's some shit I will see and then maybe someone's like, oh yeah, that guy is self-taught. He never worked in a shop. And I'm like, who the fuck can I, how am I going to tell this guy he shouldn't tattoo? This right. is like the best tattoo I've ever seen in my life. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the case for everyone. Yeah. It's a very, very rare it's case. It's rare, yeah. But it's, it, it exists. So it, what are you going to do? You know, hate on him because he never apprenticed? Yeah. Maybe there's a guy that never apprenticed. He comes out. He's like the world's most profound celebrity tattoo artist. And right. his shit is trash. And you're like, how the fuck does anyone even think this is going to I mean, that happens too, right? There's like, there's a whole bunch of, you know, there'll be this cult of personality around some certain guy who does a certain thing. And yeah. somebody endorses it. You know, Bieber has a tattoo on his fucking pinky toe. And everyone's like, I got to get it. And now this dude's huge. You know? Yeah. Like, I mean, that shit happens with everything, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of the way it is. You just have to go, okay, yeah, that's fine. No, for that sure. That guy's getting his bag. Like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, let's see, I got to check on Omar. Um, so, yeah, you're... So then, how does it go from... Because now you're doing... Like, you're bro- you're working with Porsche, right? Do you want to Yeah, I just did that? a little project with Porsche. Just a little project. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it, there's more content. I and mean, it wasn't like I'm... Uh, there's like I have other friends that are doing big, big, big projects with Porsche. It's right. just like a cool little content piece. But so they're using you as like as a person. Are you designing stuff with them? No, or? no, no. It's more so a lot of the stuff that I do is because I'm into a lot of things. Like, and yeah. I, I, you know, I think they're cool, and right. I like to. So you already had an interest in Porsche. Interact, yeah, right. and it goes for a lot of things. Like food is a big thing. So, right. you know, sometimes. The way we work now is you share stories with people that are into it and like to tell the story with it. So, right. you know, with Porsche, it was kind of, you know, they know I'm into Porsche. I have a relationship with a lot of people there. Um, you know, I dress a certain way. I look a certain way. I create a certain type of art. Maybe right. this is a cool perspective that he can tell with Porsche. Right. And same goes with, you know, Gap or... Did you do a Gap thing? I did a Gap campaign. Yeah, oh, it was shit. like Young Creatives. Oh, no. oh, I was probably the oldest one, but right. <laughs> not Young Creatives. Maybe just creatives in that space. But, right. you know, there was... It's like there's all these separate projects that, you know, you can tell your story yeah. just using their platform. And, and that's interesting to me. And I think well, that's interesting for a lot of other people that want to kind of do that. And I think it's interesting too because these companies, right? These big established companies have been going to have a certain trajectory and they're dealing with a certain type of people, but then they realize that like, wait a minute, the whole world has become like person to person influence and like Instagram and all these things. Like we have to interact with these guys that we would never have interacted totally. with before. Right? Like you doing Gap is wild. Like a tattoo artist doing Gap or Porsche is crazy. Yeah. Right? And you know, I would have never thought that that would happen, but they but they're forced to you know, they have to keep up with the times and then they have to pivot and go, okay, well, what's this guy? Yeah. All right, well, let's throw him in it. It's not just like. I mean, there's, a, you know, another big project I have now is with the, you know, really world renowned Swiss watch company. It's like one right. of the top ones, Geneva, based in Geneva. It's like Roger Dubuis and like, uh, you know, the heritage there is crazy. And these are like legitimate luxury time That's pieces. crazy. And like, you know, we have a cool one coming out. This this kind of stuff, like a guy like me would never normally have a platform like that, you know? And there is this little doorway where people kind of want to say, hey, let's try to crack this community. Let's try to like dip our toe in. And, you know, a lot of out- people 
from the insider and be like, outsiders are trying to come in and use our marketability, which has been happening in every aspect of fashion or any commercial marketing with skateboarding, right? Skateboarding yeah. is always the the go-to like, hey, right. we need to reach a new audience. Let's take our influence from skateboarding. Right. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. Like, I don't even know what our scene is anymore. Artists, creatives, like we come up from a certain time. Yeah. But I do think now it's beyond like just me as a tattoo artist. Right. It's like, it's like everything. It's you know? a brand. Yeah, you've, you know? you've, you've become a brand. And the brand is being leveraged into other things. And that's why you become a brand. Yeah. Right. And the thing is, like, if you wanted to be this core tattoo guy who only did tattoos and was pissed off, then you can be, that's fine too. Yeah. You can do whatever the fuck and you I want. Am. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I think, I think it's like, you know, I think also the, like, because I'll have, I'll have conversations with sponsors all the time. He's like, we should go do this. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Cause I still have such an old way of thinking. We're like, I'm not fucking yeah. with that. And sometimes it'll change my mind. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, he's like, well, what if? And I go, okay. And I open up to it and I go, okay, fine. And then, cause I'm just like, I still have that voice in my head too of like, don't fucking sell out, you know? Sure. Whatever the fuck that means. I'm in business. I'm an yeah, entrepreneur. Yeah. How, that's the whole point. Not to sell out. Like, I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna like work with you know the army. Right? No, no, of course, of course, right? Like we still have our lines. <laughs> yeah, there's certain things like I'm not gonna endorse, like you know the LAPD. Yeah, yeah. Certain things I'm not gonna do, but like you know, I don't know. Pollo Loco comes with a bag, maybe. I don't know. I'm just talking shit for sure. But right? there, there is that like level of what when I was that age and I was like, I'm never gonna sell out, or if I see someone that I was like, oh, he sold out. I never had the concept of a mortgage and kids and right. a family. And I never even knew that you can decide on the level of your sellout. Like right. you can still, like how is it selling out if if you are actually giving back and you're kind of creating more opportunities for people in your field to get the bag, yeah. right? Yeah. And when I was a kid, I remember I was talking to Tony Hawk. I was tattooing Tony Hawk. And I remember we were just talking about growing up skateboarding and he was like, I did a Bagel Bites commercial yeah. and every back back in the day and yeah. everyone was saying I was a sellout. Yeah, like, yeah. oh, Tony sold out, Tony sold out. And especially at skateboarding scene yeah. at the time, it's like so cool, right? And then he's like, now I just like did, I forgot what it was, like a, you know, a decade later, he did another Bagel Bites something. And he's yeah. like, everyone is yeah. saying, you got the bag, yeah, you yeah. got the bag. And yeah. it's like, are we just a representative of like who we feel at the time? Because what if the audience, tone changes and it's like oh now you're not a sellout now you're getting the bag right it just changes like that and that like you know i think it's okay you know it's shifted it's, it's totally all shifted. it's totally shifted because you know if if i work with with a giant company and they give me access to a new audience like i'm i'm just a dude that came out of a fucking place and is trying to make something I'm not here, like I'm trying trying to build something from from fucking nothing. Yeah. You know, bare hands is trying to make something happen. So if I get like, you know, someone gets me access to something and I can open up doors, like, yeah, that's the point. You know, I think it's like just keeping your integrity is really the thing. Yeah. It's like as long as you have your integrity, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not putting on a fucking jester hat and dancing for anybody. I think it's okay to do No, for sure. But also like the the playing field is like totally shifted and leveled because now I don't think people are even give a shit about anything. Like, no, it's like I think everything's, so yeah, yeah, anyone can do anything and yeah. no one's gonna be pissed off. And, yeah. you know, but even like for the gap thing, there was a time in my life where I'd be like, fuck that. Like yeah. I would never touch something so corporate and like yeah. mainstream and blah, blah, blah. But fast forward a few years, I'm like, dude, when I grew up walking through the mall, you know, every ad, gap ads were famous, you know what I mean? And it was always like some white dude or some, you right. know what I mean? Right. And now people sending me pictures of like my tatted ass head. Right. It, like looking all fly on, on a huge fucking poster and right, gap. Right. Yeah. It's kind of cool. It's like that a little cool. bit of representation. And representation. You know yeah. what? If you want to leverage and exploit me for your needs, I'm going to do the same right back, you know? Right. And, and exactly. And also, would you rather see us doing it or do you want to have someone the same else. old people do it? Or have find some Asian kid, put some fake tattoos on his ass. Right. And then make the thing. You right. Know? Yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. It's like, you know, there's representation and we're also getting into spaces that we would never have access to. I never thought I would be able to access a lot of things. For sure. But now there's access because we just kind of, it's like everything shifted. All these corporations have to look back here at us and what we're doing and we're doing stuff from the ground up and it's like they have to look at this world yeah and it's validated and uh you know it's all it's all part of the shift it's all it's also part of like generationally like as we get older you know your values change and it's like okay you got kids well that's a whole different ball of wax totally. you know you got kids in the mortgage it's like okay well 
you know, it's. Well, the big, the big thing that changes too is like when you have kids and a family and a wife, your whole priorities change. You're not going to fucking die for nothing like yeah. anymore. You know, right. you're, you're like what your whole priorities and your balance scale of how you justify anything you do changes because right. at the end of the day, I'm going to do what's best for my fucking family. Yeah. Nothing else. Right. And that doesn't mean you have to like climb on other people or, or, you know, hurt other people in the process. Yeah. yeah. But it, if you get rid of all that, keep your integrity. Who gives a shit what anyone says, you know, right. you, well, people are always, and, and, and also people are always going to talk shit. And also I love you guys right now who are angry at either one of us. I love, I, cause I love the salty motherfuckers. Cause yeah. I'm still that guy too. Totally. And I let people are like, Oh fuck this fool. He did like, people are always gonna be angry, but that's fine because yeah. I still like that part of like, it goes with the whole idea of like hand painting your sign, hating everybody else. Totally. Coming up the old school way. Like that's great. And I think that, you know, bullying people, like all that shit is like part of the process of, of maturing and become, I'm not saying go out and be a bully. No, for saying, sure. Like, getting your head, getting your bell rung a few times teaches you a lesson, yeah. you know? And I mean, nine seven eight eight out of ten times that i've been like super salty or talking shit or the so-and-so did this and that yeah it's because i was jealous jealous i was jealous yeah, and i'm honest about that and i was yeah. like i should fucking be doing that yeah, yeah. Fuck i'm that the fool. one yeah. i earned the right to do that blah yeah. blah blah fuck him he sold out like yeah. all that shit i used yeah. to say all that shit too yeah but not until i was in the opposite seat and yeah. i'm looking at real-time decisions yeah and i'm like this is life is a chess game and i'm just trying to fucking win yeah. I don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you do it right and you stay who you are, who gives yeah. a fuck what other we're people all, think? We're all proud you know? of our shit until Ronald McDonald calls and said, <laughs> Hello, Tuto, do you want to do a project? I'm yeah. like, Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and I always check myself because I'll be like, Oh, man, am I going too far? Am I dipping my toe too far into this? And yeah. then I'll see someone else that I highly respect and look yeah. up to, and it'll be like some crazy shit. And I'll be yeah. like, Oh, man, everyone's going to hate on this fool for this. Yeah. But then I'm all like, Hell yeah. You're like, okay, I'll do it too. You know, not because they did it, but I'm like, it's a taking a leap of, of faith and just being, being strong in your conviction of your right. decision. Right. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it all the way. Not yeah. give a shit what anyone thinks about you. Well, the Tony Hawk and the pizza, in the, you know, pizza bagels, um, the Cena pizza rolls. Pizza I don't bagels? know. Is this a paid ad? Can we say yeah, that? Yeah. Pizza bagels. <laughs> Our new sponsor, pizza bagels, yeah, yeah. Tony Hawk edition. Um, <laughs> You know, like when he did it, people were like, fuck that fool. But like, it didn't change anything. Fuck no. And he just ended up having his own video game. And everyone loved that. You know? Dude. So. And he's like the most, I think for someone where you take a skill. I mean, it's hard to say about him because he's still crushing it and like skating yeah. like amazingly. But there's a lot of people that are in our kind of age group or talent pool. To, no matter what it is you do, but we get aged out. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Oh, there's, yeah. there's a That's, point. <laughs> You, yeah. It's like you yeah. can only do so much and and uh, receive all the good shit for your talent and then you have to move on. And that's the cool thing about Tony's because he showed like, yo, you can build an empire. You don't just not hinged on just one thing you're good at. You can take that one thing and transfer it into a whole lifetime of success. Again, I'm saying he's still skating, which is like incredible. Like, yeah, he's still killing it. But the, the idea behind it is there and that highly inspires me. And I see it with a lot of other artists, too, where or people and other talents where it's kind of like, yo, I, I can't physically do this anymore. And I, whether literally physically or mentally or spiritually, but I've leveraged, I've leveraged it into this whole other thing. And now I'm passionate about building and like this, this whole world that I'm doing. And that's, that to me is like true success, you know? Yeah. I mean, in order to take advantage of these, um, uh, of these, uh, of, uh, you know, of these, um, uh, openings you have to be functional and ready and a lot of the people that are core end up getting caught up where they're not functional they're not ready yeah there's a lot of distraction there's a lot of distraction on your you know you're doing this one thing you get really good at and there's a lot of shit that happens there's girls and drugs and party and blah 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 and then you have to be fully functional you got to be focused and a lot of people aren't focused yeah and someone comes to you and says you want to do this and you're in the middle so you're like i'll oh, fuck you it's like well maybe not fuck you because yeah. maybe maybe you should be thinking about one day you are going to be 70 if you get there you're going to be 60 and like you're not going to be doing the thing you were doing totally and like i don't you think i want to like i don't want to be hunched over a fucking computer in my 60s like designing shit i don't want to do it. i want to be doing something else yeah you know and, and maybe someone will be doing it for me and maybe i will still be doing this in another but it'll be in a different way yeah and i got it you got to start thinking forward I mean, you don't think that way when you're in your 20s like the way no. i thought in my 20s was like i was like 
desperate to do anything. I was like so excited that someone offered me an apprenticeship that I just stopped going to college. (laughs) You know, like, like I just didn't even think about anything. Totally. You know, just like, oh yeah, fuck. You know, and now I'm like, okay, let's be pragmatic. Let's like, you know. I mean, back then we didn't think past the week. Like we didn't think what was going to happen past the week. Now I'm like thinking about how am I going to pay for my kid's college? Yeah. I thought I was going to be yeah. dead by 30. Well, I was like, there's no way I'm making it past 30. Yeah. Like, I was like, it's it's fine. Like, yeah, I, yeah you know. it's fine. I'm, I'm at peace with that. Yeah, 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 it's okay. And then you get to 30, I'm like, oh shit. That was actually like, yeah. when I hit 30, it's when I really You're fucking- You're like, I never want to die ever. Yeah. I want to yeah. live forever. I want to live forever. I'm going to start yeah. drinking green juice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you hit 30, you're like, oh fuck it. And then that's when I started hustling as hard as I could. Yeah. And then from 30 to now, I've been like grinding myself to Same. a nub. And, uh, you know, and it, you know- I had we, my first kid at 30. Oh, you did? My lion was born when I was 30 and everything changed. You know, quit right. drugs, did everything, you know. Like, That's what everyone says. I don't have a kid, but they're like, yo, when you have a kid, because I'm always like, what about losing sleep? And the end like, that's fine. But when you have a kid, your whole priority shifts. And all of a sudden, you're like, you're doing it for something else, not yeah. just yourself, right? That's exactly. what I've been told. I don't have that yet. But I mean, if you're not a piece of shit. If you're There's not a piece of shit. plenty of piece of shit parents right, right, out there. Right, right. Shout out to the piece of shit parents. Shout out to the piece like, of shit. <laughs> You I know. mean, uh, shout out to all the pieces of shit around yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. We love you guys. Yeah. You guys are the best. You all pieces of shit. You know who you are. <laughs> um, I mean, growing up, we fucking loved pieces of shit. I was like, oh my god, those my heroes. idols were pieces of shit. My heroes like, were dog shit. Yeah, always. Like I was like, oh my god, dude, it's the best. And then you, you grew up, you're like, oh, that guy was a fucking. Piece I'm like, of what shit. was I thinking? Yeah, what was I thinking? That was my role model. Okay, Jason, cut this out, you son of a bitch. Don't leave it in. Don't even, you can leave this in, but don't leave in what was before this. Cut out the dead air. Don't you fucking do it. Don't you leave it in. He leaves it in all the time. I say cut here and he just leaves it in. He's like, it's, it's funny. Just, it's just you staring at the camera like this. Yeah, it's just me like breathing or something. Yeah. Also, if anyone's gotten this far in the show, do I have any ad reads, Alex? Yeah, we do. I do? Okay, I gotta knock that shit out. If anyone's gotten this far in the show, I wanna apologize for last week because I listened, I don't listen to the show or watch it ever. Ooh. I listened to it in the car mm. and it was like, it was me by myself. And you hate was, the sound of your own voice. It was fucking, it was me going like this. <gasps> it was me like gulping air, talking, and just like not making any sense. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize to all three cameras. Uh, and it might happen again, but I'm gonna try to correct my performance. Now I have a wonderful guest. We're having a great conversation about what it's like being at this age mm. selling out mm-hmm. going going corporate you know what i'm saying um no but uh i think uh you know and i think that we just kind of just did a a broad stroke of your story we just talked about the tattooing but there's so many because we were talking about um china right mm. and i mean we shouldn't even talk about it. that's a whole other conversation that's a big one let's talk about something else. fuck china not fuck china yeah, i love yeah. you china because i know you guys are gonna probably own me at some point but um Right? Isn't that the way it's going? I own you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not. I I don't have I don't have uh, ownership of my body and soul anymore. It's owned by the Chinese government. Um, but uh, I think that um, Sadie Hawkins. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. Time? Sadie Hawkins. Sponsor hit me up. We're going to do Sponsor it again. Wu's going to be a part of Sadie Hawkins this yep. year as a host. Yes. He brings a certain amount of culture, expertise. <laughs> very refined taste. Yeah, very yeah. refined gentleman. Uh, as I said, a gentleman of letters, a doctor. Uh, he's going to be operating on people. Uh, that's so dumb. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Sadie Hawkins this year. Yep. It's going to be at a wonderful, wild location. Are you All... saying it yet or no? No, no, no. We're okay. not saying it okay, yet. Cool. But it's like. I'll, I'll take just... it off my Instagram then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take that shit down. Uh, actually, I don't think that this year for Sadie Hawkins. I don't think anyone can even get in. So remember all the last years, like yeah, yeah. I'm saying like all the people would come without an invite and just like go bananas outside yeah, the door. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I go to get people outside and yeah. it's just like, it's a, yeah, it people, was crazy. People getting their, their hips crushed yeah. between the gates and like yeah. trying to wedge their way in everywhere. Yeah. I think we finally found a way to like, f- to fend off the walking dead and filter in the people that needed to go. So, but that place sounds like it can fill. We could get a lot of people. A lot of us. But we don't want too many people because then uh, it's like, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah, it's true. We're true. doing fucking Coachella? Like, no, we want to nah. keep it intimate. We yeah. want it to be fun. We want it to be nice. We're going to we're gonna cultivate the audience. Yeah. It's going to be a beautiful night. It's, and listen, every time it's beautiful. I'll say that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very beautiful event. Love to see most of you there. All of you guys are coming, obviously, but we're not going to tell you where to go because you can't come. But I hope to see you there, but not really. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't want you telling all your third tier friends. Yeah, no third tier friends. Only like... Second Best tier. friends. Best friends. <laughs> only BFFs. Only group chat friends. Yeah. Only. Only group chat homies. Yes. For sure. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's so much more to cover, but I think we have to go on with our day. That was a good solid hour, right, Alex? Um, I have to go get my dog and I have to go have a meeting at Air One as we're prone to do. Dude, I almost had a meeting at Air One. That's where the meeting was supposed to be before I came to meet At you. which Air One? This one or that one? Silver Lake. Oh, Silver Lake. Yeah. yeah. But we just weren't sure if they had Wi-Fi or not, so we couldn't go. We oh, yeah. Go. We didn't even get into that whole conversation. We didn't even get into our crypto NFT combo. Maybe it's better left to that's another. That's a whole. That's a whole thing. Other episode. Is there anything else that, that we didn't uh, we need to talk about here with uh, Doctor? I mean, we really just talked about tattooing for an hour. Yeah. Which is. Gonna I mean, be, that was just the base of just like, the base of like me in tattooing. You, we didn't even touch into the stories at the shop. Like <sighs> we didn't even get into it. Stories. Man. Such good stories. Like crazy stories. Fuck! I wish I didn't have to go to this appointment. Um next time next time yeah 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 the the shop stories shop i mean this is the shit crazy. that i saw in my brief tenure at yeah. a tattoo shop i mean i don't know what it was like at your shop but like it was commonplace for souls to get knocked out oh for like God. people coming off the street just like it was it was the first week i worked there if you have time to just put this in real yes, quick yes the first week i worked there yeah we got into a huge brawl on sunset boulevard all you guys in the shop oh, no it was three of us i'm not gonna name names but it came in, one of the homies came in that worked there was like, dude, I just got jumped. Nice. And I was like, you know, obviously I knew all these guys before working there. Yeah. But this is also my first week. I'm like, you know, the here. lowest on the totem pole. And ball. I'm like, oh shit, it's on. I didn't even think twice. I was like, all right, threw my shit off and I ran outside. I'm like, point, point me at him, you know? And then yeah. the other homie came and we ended up chasing these dudes down and we scrapped them in the parking lot above Bank of America where What's that um, across the key club? I think it was the key club at the time oh, on yeah. Sunset. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went in there and we were just throwing hands, just banging. And thankfully, we fucked these dudes up. But it was that was like my second day. And I was like, man, I'm already scrapping dudes. Like, you know what I mean? And the best part was, you know, because all the homies at the tattoo shop were like pretty scary. Like, yeah. you know, they're, they're not like people to be taken lightly. Yeah. So I was like, you know, who dare mess with these guys? So we ran out, and of course, who who would step to a guy that's scary? Cholos, a scarier guy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So the first dude I look, I'm like, oh fuck, it was gangsters. It was gangsters. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, here we go. Yeah. And like, <laughs> luckily, like we just you know we just got into it, and then some other homies from the shop came, and right. like we ended up chasing these dudes down, and fucking them up. They they right. were taking cheap shots at, at our boy, you know. And uh, I and then we ran back and like washed the blood off and like did the whole thing and it was like a really good like camaraderie bonding yeah. and I was like all right I earned my place here no one can say shit like I didn't put out you know what I mean like yeah and it brought us three together and it was pretty cool you know is well that's that's another that's just one <laughs> that's one thing that's one day in the shop that yeah had you done like you know like fucking up someone's dental or appointment had you done it wrong could mean the end of your tent i did your, that a lot too but yeah. yeah but but i think you doing that and yeah. making the right decision uh you know it's those small things they have to know totally. you're down to like you know you know what this is yeah like, someone comes in, this is a shop right and that's the thing it wasn't just a job to me like right and that was what tattooing was as a whole right there was essentially it was like a family like right. uh, it was its own little neighborhood you know right. and you were in there by that and right now you know there's I, I dare say like people have assistants or whatnot like dude no kid's gonna go fight for you and no. you know what i no, mean no. no kid's gonna jump out and go fight they're gonna be like you know i'm they're gonna cancel they're you. gonna cancel you you yeah. know what i mean like not saying that you know not saying that that shouldn't be the way it is because obviously times have changed yes but back then that was just the arena that we were playing at when we entered you know yeah. that was the entry level kind of uh ticket at the door baseline shit. Like that's you, just what you had to do yeah. it wasn't just a job it yeah. was like a lifestyle you know? yeah yeah i mean that's that's why and that's what tattooing is. i don't know if tattooing now is a lifestyle to anyone anymore i do think it's kind of like this cool job like i want to be a dj yeah it sounds like a cool job it's just another one of the five pillars of drip right it's like tattoos djing yeah hair dye no uh, one's gonna sneakers. come yeah. and break your fingers for tattooing anymore right in their neighborhood right. or if you put a shop in down the street yeah you know? i mean i love i used to love those i was just sitting listening to those stories all day about you know guys moving a shop down the street and then they fucking blow the shop yeah you know, all that i mean again not celebrating that yeah. saying that that was a great thing but you know, there is, it just goes to show you the richness 
yeah. and the passion and the history there were boundaries of this yeah. of this art form right? yeah you know this this kind of it's like the, it's like with the internet there and it's interesting like the internet happened instagram social media happened you know probably about seven years ago when it really yeah. started and when that happened there were still boundaries i think back then and once it happened now there's no boundaries there's no lines there's everything none. is and even socially like there's just nothing yeah it's just fucking everyone does whatever the fuck they want at all times yeah and all the rules are are gone no boundaries no rules it's just like free for all and uh you know i think that uh all you assistants out there alex you need to start jumping in <laughs> and i need to see i need to see you you know i need the shirt off i need you swinging for yeah. no reason um that's thank a good you. that's a good point to end on yeah thank you so much for coming um it was good to have you it's great to be here yeah yeah it was we good see each other all the time i know and now it's I know. cool to no it was great talk i could talk about this shit I and mean, we didn't even get into the stories maybe yeah. another time we'll figure it out um cool